Be prepared, I whispered to myself. Be prepared, I whispered again, and then again, and then another time after that. As I whispered this phrase on repeat, I packed my bag full of all the things I was certain I would need. Even then, though, I was certain that I would forget something. I always have. I always did. Anyway, I digress. I'm not very comfortable giving my name, but let me just tell you a little bit about myself. In this present time, I am 21 years old, a senior in college, and I was once a Boy Scout. A very proud and active Boy Scout at that. Starting from the age of five with the Tiger Cubs, I was constantly involved with everything pertaining to the craft, or crafts in this case, with the number of merit badges there are. Though I loved every bit of scouting activity almost equivalently, the one I loved above all else was probably its most commonly known one, camping. Not only was it great fun being able to hang out with friends around the campfire and sing American Pie, or whatever other song might fit the occasion, but it was also quite unnerving to say the least. Just being out in the middle of nowhere. Now, I'm not trying to say that I enjoy being scared or anything, but I certainly enjoy the rush of adrenaline. The pure excitement of what camping really was. Just being out there in the untamed wilderness, in a place where mankind had not found any sense of true safety or comfort in since the first few centuries of its own existence. It just goes to show why the word bravery is a part of the scout law. Successfully spending the entire night out in such an unpredictable and potentially hostile environment can make all sense of fear seemingly wash away. One will feel like they can face anything, do anything, or at least that's how I once felt. So back to me packing my bag. It was a Friday afternoon in October, close to Halloween, ironically enough. I was only a freshman in high school, 14 years old at the time of this trip, which I would be leaving for the following Saturday morning. I can still remember what forest it was that we were going to. It was somewhere in the middle of Bear Mountain State Park, I think. All I knew was that our troop had never really been there before, not even before I joined. In the Scoutmaster's own words, they were trying to mix things up for a change and give us the sense of real wilderness. My dad, being one of the Scoutmasters, clarified this statement for me later on. He explained that the place was much farther out than our previous campouts, far more isolated away from civilization. My heart raced from pure excitement as he further explained that we would be hiking in order to get to the location, a good five miles at that. All we'll have to camp is whatever we can carry on our backs, he concluded with a smile. That was about two weeks ago. Now, here we are, packing the car only sparsely, and then hugging my mom goodbye. As we turned the corner to leave our tent, I looked behind my seat and into the trunk at what little supplies we had. The two tents we had were just about the smallest I had ever seen. They could only fit about one person each, lest one be willing to sleep on top of the other. We drove for well over two hours, yet... With such a long drive, only about a quarter of it was spent in the modern world. In but the first half hour, we had already sped past the last of any building that stood to be more than two stories tall, then left the highway about ten minutes after that. From there, we were consumed in a strange, yet familiar world, one that I had frequented many times before. There were still some buildings to be seen amongst the overgrown fields and towering trees, but spotting one was about as infrequent as spotting another car traveling the opposite direction, or even a deer along the side of the road. Even in the daylight, during the autumn season better yet, both the living and inanimate objects 
one could see about the wild terrain were shrouded over by the ever-thickening layers of twisted branches and browning leaves. At some points I would even find my eyes fooling me into believing that the withered stump of a long-since fallen tree was actually the shadow of a stranger, a ghost, if you will, just hauntingly staring out from the trees to watch the passers-by. The dirt and rock on the road grew constantly rougher upon reaching the last thirty minutes of our journey. The sound of our stock in the back of the van rattled so loudly from the incessant bumping of the vehicle that I'd swear we were carrying a grand load of heavy steel beams, ones used to build the frame of a massive skyscraper. My dad snickered. Well, he called over the commotion, it's a good thing we didn't take your mother's car, am I right? I snickered too as I answered back. Yeah, she'd probably have our heads on spikes. We both laughed. Another hour had passed when I turned around and realized that I couldn't see our van anymore. Beyond those few scouts that laundered behind as we hiked, all there was to view was the front line of trees that overshadowed those further back into the scenery. Those other trees were only discernible by the wind's steady movement of their dark outlined branches and the crackling, snapping noises they made on occasion. Then, I could see something else moving amongst it. Something. No. Many things that moved through the foremost tree line. The collection of small black shapes fluttered in multiple directions, some up into the sky and others between the lower and higher branches. Just barely over the other scouts' conversations, could I hear the tweeting go back and forth. One of few sounds of nature that one could also take listen to back in our suburban neighborhood. I looked back forward, past the other scouts and the leading scoutmasters that my father chatted with, to see up over the hill as we climbed. There was not much to gander at for a few moments, but then we finally crossed over the last bit of the slope, bringing all that was good into view. It was an unspeakably massive work of natural art. The valley that lay at the base of our current high ground was deep and wide, like the aftermath of a deadly asteroid impacting the earth. But I would be lying if I didn't say it was one of the most incredibly gorgeous things I had ever seen in my life. It was like a physical rainbow, what with the autumnal colors that formed endless lines of red, yellow, and then red again, but then green at the outer edges where the pit finally reached a limit. Such was where the pine trees lay untouched by the seasonal drop in everyday temperature, whilst those that ran down the middle were unable to withstand it. It was still one and a half hour until midday, yet the sun beamed down almost vertically upon the landscape, the assemblage of color gleaming as though it were a diamond or a coating of snow in late January. Off to the left was a mountain, bare mountain, I assumed, looking down upon this breathtaking piece. It was as though it were the creator itself looking down from the heavens to indulge in the splendorous image it had gathered together. I will never forget that moment. That one moment of pure joy where all seemed right with the world. That moment where all hostile things had seemingly melted away from this truly wild land, ceasing to exist. Just that one perfect moment. It lay on my mind as we sat around the fire together some eight or nine hours later. We now sat somewhere at the valley center somewhere between two lines of red and yellow painted trees. We had worked long and hard that day. The hiking was one thing, but the hours of collecting branches and logs were a whole other story. Gathering firewood was, without a doubt, the only activity I truly hated in scouting. The scoutmasters were sticklers when it came to it, always insisting that we never had enough. I've mocked them for it too, joking that we might as well just burn the whole forest down. 
Then again, it was always an impressive fire, especially that particular night. We had to sit at least six feet away from it. It was so hot. The sun was sitting just at the valley's edge, its light creeping over an even more brilliant red than that of the fire, when at the same time Scoutmaster Daniels, unimaginably, pulled out his guitar. The fact that he would bring it up this far, with all the natural obstacles to get through, was just maddening to me. The fun that followed, however, made me easily forget. We sang any song we could think of for a seemingly endless amount of time. One person even requested that we sing the ridiculously annoying campfire song from Spongebob Squarepants, which Scoutmaster Daniels unfortunately accepted. Then again, having grown up watching the show, I did end up singing along just a bit. It was around the time that the fire and our lanterns became the only source of light left in the wood that we began to tell our annual ghost stories. These were nothing new to me. I had heard all the classic ones like Bigfoot, The Hook, Bloody Mary, and so forth. There was even this one joke story we would tell where the serial killer turned out to be a simple window wiper looking to offer his service to someone. I believe it was called The Viper. Yes, The Viper was its title. I had become so accustomed to these stories that I, remarkably, began to doze off a bit. I let out a yawn. The long, overspoken tales of the boogeyman became like white noise, minuscule background noises. The boogeyman did not hinder my slumber. I leaned my head back in my little pop-up chair and gazed into the air above me. In the shadows, the branches almost resembled tangled and twisting spider webs that stretched across the small fissure in the forest's canopy. Through it, though, I could make out the night sky. The stars were seemingly of endless numbers in scope, no speck of cloud to be spotted anywhere in between them. The crystal clear nature of it made me think for a minute, then finally declare that I would sleep without my tent's rain fly that night. When I finally did turn in, the fun was still at its height around the fire pit. It almost seemed to have grown higher since I had left. The light from the flames gleamed brighter than ever before and cast the blackened outlines of moving persons all along the tent walls. The shadows mingled with those of the swaying trees that rustled and crackled in a way so similar to that of the burning wood. This level of commotion, miraculously, did not hold me from falling unconscious. My eyelids began to flutter ever so slightly until the darkness eventually took me. The sounds of twigs snapping and people laughing then fell to a whisper, and then silence. The memory of that rainbow-like valley was the last thing I saw before my eyes popped back open. What greeted them was once again the sight of the star-filled sky that glistened through the hole in the treetops above. I had no idea what hour of the night it was, what with the light of the flame and its embers being totally extinguished, leaving no shadows or outlines upon the tent walls as before. All chatter outside had now ceased. No steps or shoes upon the leaves, grass, or twigs. The tents around my own were now presumably full. Inside one of many lay those now dozing yet lacking any loud breath or a snore. The crickets were seemingly absent, too, not giving off even the smallest and most quiet chirp. Other steps and calls of the wild were undiscernible by any, especially I. The tent walls did not move or creak with the breeze, nor did any of the trees. There was a heavy lack of branches creaking and snapping from the involuntary movement. No rustling of leaves or small twigs upon the ground. The night was almost unnaturally quiet. Something then broke the silence. A growl. A very low and guttural growl. 
I felt a pain in my stomach as it wrenched the air once more. I could feel my mouth then begin to fill up slightly more with saliva. I sighed out of pure annoyance. I always ended up eating very little on these trips. Now it was costing me some well-deserved slumber. I sighed once again. The only bit of grub within reach was a large bag tied up in a tree, some twenty yards away from where I lay. The scoutmasters had done that to ensure that no larger animals could get to it. So I decided, what the hell, and sat up while fumbling through my left pocket. It was empty. My heart skipped a beat as I then went for my backpack. I unzipped every pouch, looked through every other cup holder and fold that might contain something. Anything. Damn it, I whispered. My flashlight was nowhere to be found. I was more annoyed than ever before. I just knew I would forget something. I always did. Had the firelight not lent me some illumination as I was preparing for bed, maybe I would have realized my mistake sooner. Well, either way, I was getting to that food bag. It didn't matter what darkness might hinder me. I would never fall asleep on an empty stomach. I again looked up through the roof of the tent. Through the tangled web of branches above me lay the multitudes of stars as always. But off to the right, half hidden by the much thicker layers of brush, a pale yet brilliant glow was shining down. The lunar phase was unclear due to it being partly cut off. Aside from the stars, it seemed to be my only bit of light. I unzipped the front of the tent, slowly and stealthily, as to not disturb any of the other tents. I crept out, and the darkness was, at first, an almost endless and impenetrable black. My eyes then began to adjust to the shadows. What unveiled was the outlines of trees and some other tents that lay close to my own. I threw on my boots and began to make the slow walk through the scantly illuminated land about me. I looked up into the trees and admittedly felt a chill run through me. In fairy tales you'd probably find the setting of a haunted wood with blackened and barren trees, a place where only goblins, werewolves, and witches can find a place to call home. In that moment, staring into those sparsely detailed outlines of the forest, it almost gave the feeling of being in that sort of environment. I even half expected to hear a howl somewhere off in the distance. Luckily, I did not, but I did hear my stomach groan again. Another slight pain filled my stomach. I began to watch the forest floor to ensure that I didn't trip on any loose rocks or tree roots as I walked. Thankfully, there weren't many to be mindful of. What I did see, though, was the specks of moonlight that dotted the ground. Their dim glow seemed to flicker in and out with the slight movements of branches. What little movement there was with the lack of wind. The forest was still as silent as ever. It was so quiet that I could even hear my own small breaths creeping over my lips my stomach growling again. Another slight pain filled my stomach. Then, after a few more steps, I came to the foot of one particularly large object. I looked up and felt my heart almost jump from relief. There was the rope, tied strong around the middle of the trunk. Some twenty-odd feet above me was the sack of food. Now, it was a matter of taking it down. As I reached for the rope, my stomach growled again. I felt no significant pain in my stomach. Another growl. No pain. Yet, another growl. No pain. My heart jumped again, this time much harder. The growl rang out again this time much louder. It was coming from off to my left. I shot my head in that direction 
and my eyes fell on nothing but shadow. The shrouded figure of trees and some bushes was all there was to make out in between the shapeless open void that lay ahead. I stared into the darkness for about a minute and saw nothing. Just as I was about to turn back to the tree, though, I took notice to one area of the scene. An object that appeared to be somewhat darker than the rest. It almost seemed to be growing the more I looked at it, and after some time, I began to pick up on a collection of new noises. The sounds of dirt, twigs, and leaves reacting to some kind of pressure. It grew louder and louder and louder. Something was coming. What it was, I did not know. But that was all the more reason to get back to my tent. Scouting had taught me enough about the nocturnal beasts that stalked this environment. For all I knew, it could be a bear, or even a mountain lion. I took my hands back from the rope, not loosening the knot, and slowly began to make my escape. As I crept away, I kept my eyes focused on the splotches of scant moonlight, as to ensure that I did not step on any loose objects that could potentially create a loud enough sound. I didn't hear anything else for a while. The journey back to the tent seemed to take longer than it did to find the tree. After what felt like two minutes, I passed by the first darkened shape of a tent. When I reached the presumed center of this site, the sounds of that thing's movement kicked up again. It seemed to be quieter now. I walked closer and closer to my tent, and all the while the sounds got quieter and quieter. Realizing this, I spared a moment to think. I was considering maybe just going to one of the leader's tents, or even my dad's tent. I could wake up the whole site that way and scare the thing off. I heard it move again. Crack. For a moment, I assumed it had just stepped on a particularly larger and therefore louder branch. Then, when it came to me, I ran. I ran as though being pursued by hell itself, which may have very well been the case. The sounds of leaves and twigs cracking beneath my quickened steps made me cringe. My heartbeat slammed as I heard the same kinds of sounds still close behind me. Miraculously, I had left my tent door sitting wide open. I jumped inside, zipping the door up, and then began scrambling through my bag. I found my knife sitting at the bottom of the foremost pocket. The one thing that I never forget to bring on any trips. I fell flat onto the top of my sleeping bag and waited. No more sounds. I waited in silence. I waited anxiously. All I did was stare up through the tent's roof, knife flicked open and clenched tightly against my chest. The stars were all still there, flickering through the leaves. In the middle now stood the full presence of the moon, a waning gibbous. I kept my eyes focused on it, like a pet on its owner while they eat at the dinner table. I waited. I waited for what seemed like more than an hour. There was not even the slightest creak of the tent from any small breeze. My stomach now seemed to stop grumbling, as though it too understood the situation. After some time, I finally heard something. Something low and heavy. Bumps. Two bumps that pounded steadily in my ears, with so much as half a second's pause in between. Boom, 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 boom. My pulse was racing like this from the moment I had entered the tent, but now it was worse than ever. Boom, 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 boom. The night remained deathly inaudible. I continued to stare at the moon. Boom, 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 boom. The handle of the knife was cold, yet I could feel the sweat breaking out. It soaked my palms, and some even dotted my brow. I continued to stare at the moon. 
boom, 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 crack. It seemed to have been almost two hours when I first heard that sound. It was loud, and therefore it was close. It seemed to have come from about ten feet away, through the right-hand wall of the tent. I did not keep my eyes off the moon. Boom, 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 crack. I was first confused. The confusion then quickly turned to terror. It had come from beyond the left-hand wall this time, now closer than the previous sound. Whatever this thing was, it was moving fast, unnaturally fast, in fact, at least for any larger animal up here in the northeast. I did not keep my eyes off the moon. As far as I was concerned, its light was my only real sense of protection. My glorified butter knife be damned. Yet, all I wanted was for it to become sunlight. All I wanted was for this night to be over. Boom, 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 crack. It came through the front door that time. The door didn't move or rip. Boom, 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 crack. Again, it came through the front door. Silence. Then, after about a minute, the growling started back up. It was easier to hear now being that the beast was so close, and it was truly one of the most, if not the most, strange and horrifying sound I had ever heard. What it sounded like, at least to me, was a human gargling water, yet deep in pitch, and blended in with it was something of a low-pitched humming noise. I continued to gaze intently at the half-formed orb in the sky. <laughs> My whole body tensed up. I gripped the handle of the dagger even tighter, though it almost slipped from my hands due to the profuse amount of sweat. I had to cover my mouth with my hand, what with how heavy I was now breathing. I felt my veins run cold as I heard another branch crack to my left, but I did not take my eyes off the moon. Another growl rang through the night. <laughs> It sounded angry. It was as though it were an animal standing its ground, asserting its dominance. My heart skipped a beat upon realizing this. I began to tremble, as though shivering from a chill in the air. I again almost dropped the knife when I heard the right-hand wall itself almost seem to growl at me. <laughs> my nervous system kicked in, and for the first time in hours, the moon left my sight. My eyes, my head darted over to the right-hand wall and remained focused solely upon it. For about two minutes or more I stared at it, almost in a trance as I waited for the next crack or growl to resonate from somewhere, anywhere. Silence. For an uncomfortable amount of time, there was nothing but silence. My heartbeat, once again, was all that I could hear. It did not cease its incessant pounding. Boom, 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 boom. There was no crack of a branch. Boom, 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 boom. No growl rang through the night. Boom, 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 boom. I turned my head back to the roof and resumed staring into the pale, rounded light. I was so tired now. My eyelids began to fall. The moon was going dark. No, not now. I couldn't fall asleep now. It was still out there. It had to be. I opened my eyes again. Everything still seemed dark. I took a deep breath and shook my head violently, fighting back the urge to fall unconscious. For a moment, I was somewhat calm enough so that it seemed my heartbeat was beginning to slow. Boom, 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 boom. I resumed being as I was before, staring into the darkness above. Darkness. My heartbeat quickened up again, almost faster than ever. Boom, 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 boom. The moon was gone. The waning gibbous. My only real sense of protection. My nightlight. Gone. 
The knife finally fell from my hand as I again began to tremble. It rolled down my stomach and, upon hitting the tent floor, made a metallic thud against a rock somewhere beneath the canvas surface. In almost the same moment this happened, the dark itself seemed to move. As it did, a glow began to quickly form around it, a glow so familiar that it could only be one thing, moonlight. The creature, the beast, whatever it was, was standing over the tent, staring down at me on my sleeping bag. The light of the moon and the stars outlined its ungodly figure. <laughs> A humanoid creature, it appeared to be, yet its head was almost too perfectly curved. It was almost like a sculpted head, one with no ears or even any hair. Its skin seemed to be a bit rough in texture, but the color of it was undiscernible. The most disturbing part of it all, though, was the shape of its body. While its head was somewhat skinny, its body was bloated and completely malformed. Its right arm was so much bigger and distorted than its left arm as though it had been injected with some kind of super steroid. Beyond this, the facial features were completely unseen, all there to behold being its gargantuan shadow. Then, very slowly, it raised up its much skinnier arm and began running its hand down the netting of the tent. Doing so revealed its horribly twisted hand its disturbingly long fingers making something of a scratching sound as they slowly cut through the thin, thread-like netting. I wept. I wept hard. The tears streamed down in droves. I began to hyperventilate. It grew worse and worse as the netting fell more and more in two from the creature's claws. I was no longer a scout no longer a man of courage, who had spent the past twelve or more hours on the camping trip of a lifetime, no longer one who could see the civility in an unpredictable, hostile environment. Now, I was nothing more than a child, a child that lay weak and cowardly in his darkened bedroom, shrinking away from the boogeyman that lurked in the shadows lurked inside nothing more than old tales that ran through their head. Only now, the old tales were real. The boogeyman was real. <clears throat> there was no method of escape to be found here. I was trapped. Trapped in what was inevitably my final resting place. My tent, I now must say, is comparable to that of a coffin. Above me stood my undertaker, already dead. I was already dead, and yet I found myself grabbing for the knife. I held the cold blade up to the beast and shut my eyes tightly. Even in the darkness, I could still sense its movement. Its gargantuan figure was reaching down to me. Hey! The call came from what seemed to be the back wall. Following it was the sound of movement, what sounded like two or three things rushing in my direction. The creature snarled in response, but that snarl then quickly morphed into a shrill wail, one that echoed for what seemed like miles into the night. For a moment, I half opened my eyes as it screamed seemingly in pain. In the blurriness of the scene, I saw very little. I did not see an attacker, or even hear some sort of struggle between two entities. Rather, I saw the creature, the boogeyman, in full display, shining in a beam of light for but the briefest of seconds. Hey! Go! Get out of here! <laughs> In those few moments before it had taken off, I could remember only two things about it. The pink of its skin, 
and the pale white of its eyes. The wailing echoed farther and farther away into the distance as I once again made eye contact with the moon. Its pale light was quickly overpowered, though, by many far brighter lights, the lights that truly protected me. I shut my eyes to them and saw nothing else. When I awoke, the scene had changed. Above me was a pale light, yes, but it wasn't the moon, or even heaven for that matter. It was a lamp. I sat up and found that I was inside now. The walls were painted white, and I saw, hanging on one of them, a picture of a pink-skinned humanoid, a diagram of human muscles. I was laying in a bed at the hospital. The nurse, sitting at my bedside, looked up at me and spoke. Oh, good, you're finally awake. Wait here for a moment, I'll get the doctor. The doctor came in some two minutes later. My parents followed swiftly. He explained what had happened. Everything's all right, okay? Nothing serious happened. You simply were in shock. Shock? I said, slightly confused. Yes, shock, he answered. You're truly a lucky kid, though. What, almost getting killed by that thing? Your father and the others got there just in time. Scared it away with all their shouting and their flashlights. What did you say it was again? A black bear, right? My dad nodded. I was flabbergasted. I was completely beside myself. A black bear. A damn black bear of all things. My dad had to have gotten a good look at it. He had to have seen its colors of pink and white, its absolutely grotesque figure. But, but I... I looked hard at my dad, frowning, but the face he gave in response was enough to mellow me down, the look one gives as if to say, don't. I... I guess you're right. Luckiest child in the world. I faked a smile at the doctor. He smiled back as he told my parents to follow him out of the room. As they left, my dad looked back at me, smiling slightly, and nodded. I nodded back. He is right, you know. There are very few who would believe it. I'm sure that even you, listening to this, have your doubts. Now. If you were to ask me what it was that I encountered in the woods that night, I still don't have an answer. I'm still madly searching for one to this day. Hell, I've even considered going back to that trail with a loaded firearm this time around. But even then, I don't think I would find anything. That's probably how it will remain. I mean, no one's ever captured Bigfoot, right? No cop has ever arrested and booked a hooligan for butchering a young couple with his hooked appendage. No real records out there of somebody having been slaughtered by a woman in their mirror. No parent has ever claimed, with dignity, to have seen the boogeyman hiding beneath their child's bed. Thus, my story is nothing more than a simple campfire tale. It is just as much a joke as the story of the viper. With that said, I ask of you these simple requests. If you too are a Boy Scout, or even just a simple lover of nature, think twice about what shadows are cast among the trees. Think long and hard about those stories that you hear around the campfire. Most important, above all though, if you plan to spend the night amongst those blackened, twisted shapes, having nothing but the moonlight to stand at your side. Remember these two simple words. Be prepared. For context, I attend a community college in Northern California. 
It's an overall great college, but the downside to this campus is the location. The layout of this building in particular has four floors total and also has stairs that point directly to the street and to the other parts of the campus. Let's just say crimes are the norm here. We have your average creeps too. Since I work 40 hours a week, I end up taking night classes because of how well they fit my work schedule. Recently at our campus, we had a homeless man expose himself to one of our classmates after class. Evidently was caught due to the security footage and obviously that wasn't a smart move. We also had another unrelated incident where a man was hanging around the women's restroom and was caught as well. Since this specific incident has occurred, I've been checking my email for updates on this recent incident that happened on our campus with no luck. As I was exiting out of my chemistry class, feeling dazed after taking our third exam of this semester, I called my boyfriend because we planned after class to get groceries. I usually take the stairs that are directly near the street because it's a quicker way to get to the parking lot. My boyfriend mentions that we should meet up at Walmart and I agreed. As I was going to hang up the phone, I noticed a lone man on the first floor with his bike just standing there. I did a double take to see if he was waiting for anyone in particular, but was just standing there with no expression. My boyfriend mentioned that he'll be at the store in 10 minutes, and suddenly, I hear the man laughing maniacally. It had a strange resemblance to the Joker and thoroughly sent chills down my spine. Stay on the line please, don't hang up. There's a man on the first floor laughing at what seems to be nothing. He's just standing there. All right, no problem, my boyfriend says. I head across the building to head to the other stair exit, and as I'm doing so, I can still hear the man laughing. My boyfriend told me that it would be wise to find another classmate or a student so that I wouldn't be alone, but due to having an afternoon class, most students have returned home. As I'm heading downstairs and at the corner of my eye, I can see the man is now heading in my direction, so I bolted back up. I ducked into a classroom, and very shortly after, I saw the man go by very fast. I never saw the man on campus again. I have no idea if he was insane or just trying to scare me, but I can still hear the man's mortifying laugh. I'm a hunter here in Minnesota, in a town not far north of Mill Lax Lake. I have a handful of stories detailing freaky incidents that have taken place on hunts. Here is the first. One season in particular, I was fairly deep in the woods on a snowmobile trail. When I hunt, I typically carry my knife and pack. I feel fairly confident in these woods, but this season I had some concern. The deer population seemed lower on our property recently, and we knew that there were wolves around because you would find their tracks, not to mention being able to hear them howl at night. But luckily, they typically don't mess with people. But as I was scanning for deer tracks in the dirt, I found a different set of tracks that stood out to me. They looked canine, minus the nail marks, and was a bit wider. The paw on it looked like a 150 pound animal. Then it clicked that this was a feline track, a big one and fairly fresh. I knew that there were bobcats around, but they don't get that big. So the next logical step is to assume that there was a cougar in the area. I decided to double back. So I'm heading back east on the trail when my dad calls and asks me to do a push through the woods towards his stand. So I say sure. At this point, his stand is maybe 500 meters through thick woods from me, and I'm concerned about the large predator nearby. But I also know that I'm 6'4 and about 190 pounds before putting on my gear. Statistically speaking, cougars don't tend to attack 
healthy adult men. So I push forward. I get about halfway to the other stand when I get concerned because I lost my marker. I stop to regain my bearings and then it hits me. Something in my gut tells me you are being watched. Then I notice how still the woods are. Deathly quiet. Then I hear a branch snap behind me, maybe 20 meters. I ready my rifle and scan in a circle, but only see trees and brush. I wait, and it's just way too quiet. So I push forward towards my dad's stand. The whole time, hearing something not far behind me that's quietly keeping pace. Eventually I stop hearing it, and the woods went back to normal with the birds singing and whatnot. Then I stepped out onto the trail about 40 meters from my dad's stand. I suspect it was the cougar that made the tracks. My guess is that it thought that I would pick up too much of a fight or it caught my dad's scent and chose to back off. I never did see it, but something definitely was following me. Story number two. This happened like two years ago now. I decided to take my fiance hiking after work one evening in a park with some nice bluffs to climb for a great view. If I'm honest, I was hoping to see a nice sunset and earn some boyfriend points so I could drink with my buddies on the weekend without complaint. You should know that this isn't a particularly safe thing to do at this time of night, so I gave her my tactical knife and I carried a 40 caliber pistol. We arrive and park the car before heading up the trail. Then, about 100 meters in, we spook what I assumed was a deer, which hauled ass away from us so quickly that I only saw a flash of tan. Honestly, it scared us pretty good, too. So I'm on edge, and we round a crest in a hill, and I see a black mass to my left in my peripheral vision. I unsnap the retention on my holster and turn to engage what turned out to be nothing but a mound of black dirt. So I calm down and we continue on with our nice little evening hike with birds chirping, bugs making noise, regular forest stuff. Now for the creepy part. Once we're within about 200 meters of the halfway point on the trail, it starts to feel real eerie almost like we are being watched. This time it clicked right away. The woods are now dead, but I start noticing movement keeping pace with us, so I keep us moving towards the top of the hill, the high ground which is the halfway point on the trail. We reach it and stop, and so does whatever was following us. But the woods are still dead calm, and my fiancé tells me she thinks we are being followed. So we decide to move on and take a shortcut back down to the bluff, to the paved trail. We make it and the woods get back to normal sounds again. We considered hiking more, but were a bit too spooked and left the park. Now whatever was following us I suspect was another cougar. It was quiet and we didn't see it, and the strangest part is that the stalking noises it did make sounded elevated like it was moving from tree to tree, and big cats have been known to do this. Story number three, perhaps the least explainable of the three. This one happened around June or July of 2007, I believe. I was around 17 years old and much more cocky then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwest Wisconsin, I basically grew up there in the summer and knew the woods well, but at night, it was wise to stay in the cabin or at least by the bonfire by the beach because of the bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach, and at night you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not creepy. That is, until this incident. This happened in broad daylight, 
sometime around noon. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters up the trail. We had enough at this point, and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, talking, and he was maybe 10 feet away from me. When I decided to mess with him, I shushed him and said, We're being watched. He froze, and then I realized the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right. When I saw it, its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds. But it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs crouching next to the tree, with its arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. The next thing I know, we're both sprinting back towards our cabin. I look back at the wolf or bear or whatever the hell it was, which was now in the process of full-on charging us, barreling through the brush, but for whatever reason, it stopped following us as we broke out of the tree line. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size. The wolf thing had to be nearly seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally. I have heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs, nor do wolves get that big, and black bears more waddle on their hind legs. I still have no idea to this day exactly what that thing was. When I was 13, I was standing outside of a military base in Italy. I went to school on the base, but said base didn't have many mental health options, so I ended up going to a mental health clinic off base. The therapist usually called a taxi for me, considering I had no other method of transportation to the therapist, besides my mother, who was at work at the time. I have a hypersensitivity when it comes to messages so when my therapist messaged me, saying he will be there soon, I assumed this meant that the taxi driver was going to be male instead of the usual female that picks me up. Now I have to mention early on, so people don't think I'm an idiot, that the taxis that work specifically for the clinic are unmarked. I know, it's weird, but it's Italy, so right off the bat I was expecting a man in an unmarked vehicle. Great start. I had waited for what I would consider to be long enough before a man in a white car pulled up right in front of me. At this point I should also say I don't really look like a 13 year old and tend to be grouped with 17 and 18 year olds off of appearances alone. Regardless I was standing in front of a military base so I assumed that nothing sketchy would go on right when there are armed guards only a few meters away. I ask him if he's going to the clinic and he shakes his head motioning me into the car. I get into the taxi and the first thing that sticks out is that this man is pushing obese. He has multiple stains on his plaid shirt and is definitely not taking care of himself. I wasn't given long to judge my surroundings before he was peeling out of the parking lot in front of the base. He reached behind my chair and pulled out an almost empty can of Monster, taking his eyes off of the road completely and took the finishing swig. I also realized at this point that he had no phone, wallet, or personal items in the car. I found it very strange, but it was not too unnerving. As soon as he began talking is when the first major red flag went off. This guy had a high-pitched, nasally voice and kept on repeating the word amigo while motioning between us. He most definitely was not Italian, and to be completely honest, I couldn't pinpoint where he was from 
for the life of me. It looked more Asian than anything else, but still with such a nasally voice there was no accent. Then began the touching. He kept on shaking my hand, occasionally touching my shoulder. I promise there was something mentally wrong with this guy. I always sent a specific friend a message when I was off to therapy, but this time I followed it up with, I think I'm in the wrong taxi. My phone was almost dead though, so I didn't check his reply before I turned off my phone. The taxi driver asked me where I was from, in broken English, and when I said I was from America, he seemed infatuated with the idea that I was from California. He wouldn't take any other answer. He kept on repeating the word California, so I cut my losses and just said, close, but he definitely didn't care. He pointed to himself and said what I assumed was where he was from, though for the life of me I can't remember what he said. Very quickly he moved on and asked me if I was a miss or maybe a missus, because I suppose the question might have been on my marital status. I told him I'm 13, and he shakes his head like he doesn't believe me, asking me if I was the baby of my family. The question sounded borderline sarcastic, but nonetheless I nodded because I am the baby of my family. He looked me up and down, shaking his head. No, he grinned. You're not a baby. At this point, red flags were right in front of my face. He's rambling about literally nothing, and soon he begins talking about a train station, which is when I realize we aren't going the right direction. I put two and two together very quickly, and realized that earlier on, he hadn't been telling me where he was from. No, he was telling me where we were going. My blood went cold. I was prone to panic attacks so I kept my fingers tapping on my thigh to remind myself that I couldn't freeze right now, not in a stranger's car. I ask him about the clinic. He ignores me. I ask him where we're going. He begins asking me if I want to go to a bar or a restaurant. He's ignoring my plea for the clinic and keeps on going. Bar or restaurant? He pulls over and keeps asking, though at this point I'm closing in on hysterics. I wanted to scream at him, tell him to listen to me. I couldn't. All I could say was, I'm in the wrong taxi. Instead of repeating, he finally looked at me with a confused face and asked, Taxi? My heart was practically in my stomach already, but at this point it dropped straight out of my butt. I didn't know what this guy's intentions were, and we were practically slowed to a stop at this point. With the last bit of my sanity, I threw open my door and told him I'm getting out. He went to put his hand on my thigh, but only grazed it as I was up and out of the seat within two seconds, tops. At this point, his mood changed to anger. He was talking to himself, saying, I'm so bad, and occasionally looking to me and saying, You're right, I'm no good, which was him undoubtedly trying to guilt me back into his car. He then switched to a new method, which was offering to drive me back, which I again declined and told him I wasn't getting into the car. He looked mad and finally drove off, only to park halfway up the street for a good few minutes before finally taking off. I used the last of my phone battery to drop my location to my therapist and asked her to come pick me up. I swear I saw the guy circling the base a few weeks after the incident, but I just chalked it up to me still being paranoid. This happened about a year and a half ago. The name has been changed. I used to work in a gas station where this one particular customer was a regular. Throughout interactions with this guy, I figured out there was something off about the way he socialized. This guy could ramble for minutes and minutes and minutes at a time until you told him that you had to serve somebody else. Even if there was a queue, he would still ramble. I was the new girl at the station, and everyone told me they avoided serving him because he made them uncomfortable, yet they never trespassed him or asked him to leave. Let's call him Tom. Tom was in his mid-forties and ran some kind of unregistered, probably somewhat illegal lawn mowing company where he would mow lawns for people and they would pay him cash. 
I feel sorry for his customers because I really wouldn't want this guy on my property or knowing where I lived. It started off relatively harmless, but harmless always gets freaking tiring. So he used to comment on my smile, how he liked the shape of my face and mouth. He also used to comment on my hair, which I used to dye red. It's actually part of the reason I stopped dyeing it. He even stroked it a few times. I told my site leader that I thought he was weird and he was always commenting on my looks. And I was getting sick of it now. She literally said, Well, none of us kiss his butt, so he leaves us alone now. That really pissed me off. Because I never kissed his butt. Only politely served him and asked him not to behave in certain ways. Secondly, he never left them alone. They used to run into the back room and make me serve him. One day my coworker had a heart attack and died suddenly, not at work. I was really upset because he was practically the only nice coworker towards me. There were a lot of crabby women working at the station who talked about me and made fun of me behind my back, even though I was constantly doing their work and pulling double shifts regularly. This coworker was a really wonderful, older guy, pushing me to talk to my boss about becoming a manager. Naturally, I was upset and I cried a couple of times on my shift. But once I was alone for the night, I had to hold myself together for the customers. Tom came in. It was around 8 or 9 p.m. And we have a policy called controlled door. Basically, we unlock the door for anyone who we think won't rob us. After 10 p.m., no other customers are allowed in. So yeah, Tom is buying two bottles of coke or something. I let him in because I wasn't threatened by him at this point, and I was a bit off during that shift since my coworker had just died that day. He approaches the counter and mentions that I look sick or upset, and how he heard that so and so passed away. I just said yeah, and said I was feeling a bit sad. Without warning he grabbed me by my neck and pulled me across the counter into an awkward and painful hug because my legs were hanging mid-air. I didn't say anything because I was literally so taken aback and frankly scared. Tom then said, I noticed you had the door locked and then you unlocked it for me. That must mean that you trust me. I just made some excuse about how I needed to clean the coffee machine now and he needs to leave so I can monitor the cameras. The way he grabbed me left me a sore pain in my neck for literally weeks. The next few days I told my site leader what had happened and she told me in a snarky way that I should have made an incident report the night it happened. I told her I forgot because I was shaken up. She said she would get him trespassed. A couple of nights when I was leaving around 10 p.m., he would be outside around the corner of the building and offering to take me home. I always refused and quickly got to my ride. I told my site leader this and asked when the trespass was happening and she said she was discussing it with her boss. A few more creepy comments and occurrences happened when people finally started asking him to leave. By this point everyone was aware of his behavior towards me and were actively telling him to leave. I got fed up and handed in my resignation since he hadn't been officially trespassed. It took me handing in my resignation for them on that day to go to the police and then have a sit down with me and try to convince me not to leave. I said my mind was made up. My coworkers were mean people and this guy was harassing me. I wasn't going to put my health on the line for a job at a gas station. In my last couple of weeks they switched me in between two other different sites so Tom wouldn't know where I was and to get away from my regular coworkers. My main site at the time was amazing. The coworkers were supportive and very friendly. The site leader was sympathetic and even on more than one occasion warned me when he was approaching the store, got me into the back room on time, and then went off at Tom for looking at me, telling him to leave, and that he was calling the police. I forgot to mention that when I was placed in the other sites, he would drive to each site every day to ask where I was. Someone from my old site told him. I still don't know who it was or why they would do a thing like that, even if they disliked me, but that's how he found out where I was and would come in. Thankfully, I only worked there a couple more weeks, and most of the people were proactive in keeping him away from me. After I left the job, I decided I wanted to start going to the same church my dad goes to. He swore by the church, so I read some reviews and literally found a review by Tom that was very recent, saying the church was great. 
I decided to tell Dad about Tom and said I was too scared to go to the church. Dad said Tom was harmless and he had Asperger's and didn't mean to be weird about stuff. I told Dad that he would wait for me late at night in dark areas beside my work. He would follow me between workplaces. One time I worked half a day at Site 1 and then drove to Site 2 for the other half of my shift and he was driving behind me. He made comments about how I looked and how I was just such an amazing person countless and countless times that it just became tiresome and creepy. Dad ended up speaking to the pastor and pastor told him that he had actually been banned from the church a few days ago for inappropriate hugging the women there. His wife actually came into the church to complain. She did the same thing at my workplace, saying he was innocent and had done nothing wrong. I don't know if she's stupid or in denial. Anyway, I moved cities away from where I used to live, and I'm very thankful that Tom never found out where I lived or hurt me in any way. I look back on those times where he waited for me in the car park at 10 p.m., and I literally shudder at the thought. The Hester House was a legend passed down from class to class in my high school over the decades. Students and even teachers told a variation of a story about a house belonging to one of the earliest families in our community in central Pennsylvania that burned down a century earlier but reappears with the first full moon in October. The story was based on a real house that belonged to a family which owned much of the land in the country but sold it off for residential and commercial development over the decades. When the house burned down in the 50s, it took with it the last of the Hester family line. The problem was that no one knew where the house had been. There were some old foundations along the southern slope of Peters Mountain, but none of them could be linked historically to such a house. The only history was that of the suburban legend, which evolved over the years. The one thing that remains constant was the promise of a treasure hidden underneath the floorboards in the house. If you found the house while it existed in our realm, you might find cash, gold, jewels, enough to make you rich. Of course, if you didn't get out of the house before it disappeared, you would go with it and become a ghost inside its walls forever. Of course, this was the excuse used by high school kids over the years to go into the woods up on Peter's Mountain to camp, or have a bonfire, or really try to find the house. In the 80s, it was still a time when parents didn't mind their kids being gone overnight, and none of us had cell phones. Overnight games of Dungeons and Dragons were common on weekdays, and my gaming group was led by a kid who lived at the base of Peter's Mountain. He and his brothers loved the story of Hester House, and as October approached that one year, he took a break to persuade us to leave our tabletop adventure and go on a real one. We were a group of six boys aged 16 to 17, and it was easy for us to tell our parents we were staying over at Cliff's house for a marathon weekend D&D session. Instead, we gathered campground material and agreed to head up to the mountain to a small campsite Cliff knew, and as the full moon rose over the mountain, search for Hester House. Of the six of us, we lost the 16-year-old for lack of permission. We lost two more who chickened out. So the three of us remaining had to split the gear, which put us behind schedule for the camp. The woods were damp and leaves were already falling across the trail, making the shallow uphill slippery and the steeper climbs treacherous. Getting up in the daylight was going to be fine, but after dark, there would be two miles between camp and Cliff's home and another three miles back to town, so we were committed. We reached the clearing, where Cliff and his brothers and a lot of Hester House seekers made camp. It was a relatively flat area, with a view down the mountain into the trees, but we were totally insulated by trees and cut off from the world by the sound of the forest, with only the regular whistle of a distant train to cut through it. By the time we reached this camp, we had lost a half hour and scrambled to assemble dry firewood, start a fire, and get the tent pitched. The wind rose from the west and cut through the trees making our activities difficult. From there things started to fall apart. 
There were poles missing from the tent bag. We could only find a limited supply of dry firewood to get the campfire started. The wind freshened and darkness swept over us as the sun set behind the mountain top and clouds approached from that direction. The temperature plummeted from the mid 50s while we worked up a sweat to the low 40s with the chilling breeze. Cliff and I struggled to improvise solutions for the tent, using branches to prop up walls and tying others to trees with nylon rope. Meanwhile, Keith fumbled and stumbled trying to get the fire lit, resorting to lighting an entire box of matches under the kindling in a gamble to get the fire lit and hot enough to dry out the moist firewood. We knew that any significant rain was going to put it out, and we would be huddled together in our sleeping bags under a saggy tent all night. We abandoned the idea of searching for Hester House and prepared to weather a storm. Once we established some kind of camp, the rain held off for a while, just bringing in a cold drizzle. We took turns maintaining the fire and threw shade at one another for not checking the equipment or planning for the weather and generally being miserable. As the light faded, we heard movement in the woods around us. Definitely human footfalls through the leaves. It cut through the sound of dried leaves rustling and falling from the whistling wind through the trees and the updraft that blustered up the side of the mountain. Suddenly a big object landed right in the middle of the campfire, throwing hot embers and burning twigs in every direction, including our tents. The evening brightened in a dance of fireflies over the fire. We stepped out to find out what happened. Did a limb fall? Was it a wet branch popping with boiling water pockets? It was a rock the size of a basketball. Cliff pointed out the dark figure standing in the trees on the side of the fire. It was a tall husky figure standing, slightly hunched like he was getting ready to charge or run away. Movement through the woods resumed and we detected three other people about 50 feet up and down the mountain around the campsite. The first figure we saw stood motionless for moments. Cliff yelled, more ticked off than afraid. Who are you guys? Don't mess with the fire. The first figure started laughing. It wasn't another kid. It was an older raspy laugh, joined by the older sounding voices in laughter. A softball sized rock struck the tree trunk over my head and bounced off to one side. Another sailed over Keith's head and struck the tent snapping the branch holding up the one side. We scattered. I don't know what the others were thinking, but I wanted to keep trees between me and as many of them as I could. The laughter intensified and more rocks landed in the campsite. I slipped in the wet leaves and slid down towards one of the men, and he rushed forwards towards me with arms out. He was wide and slow, juggling as he advanced, and laughing like it was the funniest thing he'd done all year. He slipped and planted himself face first in the muddy ground. By that time I had traction and was heading back up the slope towards camp. I took a small rock to the shoulder, but it glanced off my padded shoulder and I kept moving. I got to the camp and one of the men was standing in front of the fire, his features still in the shadows. He pointed at me and roared, Leave Hester House alone. He then took a couple of burning logs and tossed them into the tent. He ran off, chased by the others in the same general direction. Cliff and Keith rushed back. The tent was a loss. We had to smother it. And then it began to rain. A wall of rain rushed in from the west, and it poured so hard that it put out the fires and left us in darkness. We huddled together to be able to talk over the rain. Are they gone? Where did they go? What do we do? We had flashlights. And while cold and soaked, we were uninjured. We gotta get out of here. We heard footsteps in the darkness, and a single beam of light shot out from the forest over us. The voice from before screamed, Leave the Hester house alone. Get out of here or we will kill you. We abandoned our gear except for the flashlights, and Keith led us away from the site down the mountain. We were moving at half the speed coming up. It was sloppy and slippery, and the rain was relentless. We slid on our butts over the steep parts, and had to stop to work out a way down that wouldn't risk us breaking our legs or necks. Every time we stopped, a rock would sail between us, 
and snap against the other rocks or a tree, and a voice would shriek at us to go. Go or we will bury you on this mountain. I want the skinny one. She's cute. A rock hit Keith on the cheek and nearly sent him over an incline, but he dropped to his knees to keep from rolling. It dazed him, but his adrenaline kept him moving as the skin swelled and darkened. I said the first thing that I thought off to Cliff. If these are your brothers and their friends, Cliff, I will be so pissed. Cliff shook his head. No, not them. They would never do this. And I believed him. But most of the town dating back a generation or more did know about the Hester House story and the date. It would be easy for somebody with bad intentions to come out into the woods on the first full moon and wait for a bunch of stupid, unprepared kids to make a camp far from witnesses. Suddenly the stories about the kids going missing inside the Hester house trying to get the treasure made me think if anyone actually did go missing on a dark night in the woods and the house was just a cover story too. A rock hit me between the shoulder blade with the power of a fastball. I felt something pop in my spine and a sharp shock up and down my entire body. After what felt like hours in the increasing darkness, dry heaving from the panic and the struggle, coughing and spitting up snot and rainwater, we came to the road close to Cliff's house. There was a man standing underneath the streetlight by the street. He had the same predatory hunch as the man at the campsite. Soon three or four other figures appeared and blocked our way. We stopped and they began moving towards us. Suddenly our silent prayers were answered when a truck rolled around the corner, heading up the hill, and bathed them in its headlights, blinding them. These were not kids or young adults. These were older men, faces in their fifties or sixties, bloated and wrinkled, covered in dirty clothes and windbreakers. They were ugly, evil-looking men who had worn us down to exhaustion and were ready to strike. The truck did not slow down, but it gave us a break. Cliff pulled us to one side of the path and back into the woods along a smaller, natural path along the road. With a supernatural reserve of strength, we cut through the barbs and brush like rabbits, eluding wolves, and came out scratched and scraped across the street from Cliff's house. The porch light was lit and the garage door wide open. Cliff's dad was working on something inside the garage. We heard the men chasing us along the road, but once they saw the lights of the house, they stopped. We didn't stop until we were in the garage yelling at Cliff's dad that there were men after us. Cliff's dad called the cops. Cliff's mom took us inside, dried us off, and helped tend our injuries. The cops never found anybody, but they scolded us for being irresponsible enough to go camping in the woods without supervision or preparation. The sergeant there saved his strongest words for Cliff's parents, effectively ending our weekend D&D games. Prevailing wisdom was that it was probably some old guys who lived over the mountain who just wanted to scare some kids out on Hester House night, and they dismissed our dramatic interpretation of the peril which was, in their minds, the product of our excitement and hormones. The newspaper took a decidedly Halloween approach to the story, spinning it as a tantalized tale of transients stalking local kids on a camping trip but who knows what in mind when they caught us. But weird Hester House guardians in the woods, it's been over 30 years. But if I'm ever in the neighborhood again, I hope we never meet. Because I'll straight up murder you. I'd like to think I have pretty decent instincts now when it comes to knowing who has bad intentions. But I wasn't always as cautious and observant as I am now. When I was in high school, I always felt so ugly. I had low self-esteem and anxiety, which was really more of a problem rather than my looks. So if anyone of the opposite sex gave me a little attention, I would start to like them. I was pretty innocent despite how desperate I was, having only kissed one boy so when I was 17 and a college guy put interest into me, I immediately clung to him. I was on this app before Tinder, and I met a guy who lived seven hours from my home city. His name was Brandon, and he was gorgeous. Blonde hair, muscular, blue eyes. He played soccer for his university, and was 19. 
Honestly, he wasn't my usual type. I really liked guys with darker hair and eyes. I still do, but he was really handsome and really kind. He would shower me with compliments and talk to me all the time. I lived alone in an apartment with just my cats, so when I would get lonely or scared, he would always comfort me. A month into talking, he started asking for pictures. Not ones of my face, but obviously nudes or bra pictures. Now this was nearly six years ago, and I didn't have a good concept of stranger danger on the internet. I mean, smartphones had only really been around for two or three years at this point, at least in my school and with my age group. 17-year-old me, who was so insecure, wanted to make him happy because I couldn't believe I had gotten a guy to like me. I was ready to do anything he asked. I never sent naked pictures. I was way too insecure for that. But I would send pictures of me in my bra. He would shower me with compliments saying how sexy and beautiful I was. And I fell for every word. With time, I started to get upset, though. I wanted to see him. I would always send him pictures when he asked. But he never sent me any. He would show me body pictures of him with his shirt off or things, but the pictures were always bad quality. When I started getting too persistent, he promised he would start calling me. For some reason, this appeased me, and we would talk many times a week. After a couple of months, he got increasingly more sexual with me, telling me what he wanted to do with me and how badly he wanted me. This made me nervous since I had only ever kissed a boy but it also made me a little excited. It felt really good to be wanted by someone that I had really grown to like. This was all during the first semester of my senior year of high school, and I was going to turn 18 the next semester in late January. As it got to Christmas time, he started to talk about coming to my city to see me for my birthday. This had me really excited, since I wanted to see him in person so badly. We had first talked about me going to him something he had insisted on, but I chickened out and said I couldn't do the drive alone. An excuse, I really didn't want to go to an older guy's house and stay with him alone. My own house made me feel more safe. We planned on a weekend after my birthday and everything seemed fine, but then one day in my choir class, my best friend, an exchange student from Germany, was talking with me about him. I was telling her about him and showing pictures and she got very unsettled. Have you seen him on video? I told her no, and she gave me a skeptical look. Something just doesn't feel right. There is no way he is real. Not that you couldn't date someone like him, but he's too perfect. She was very direct and blunt with me about it, something my other friends weren't. So I took her words deeply, and I'm so thankful I did. I immediately asked him for a picture of his face. He made up some excuse about how he couldn't take a picture right then. So I persisted, asking every day. Finally, my instincts were kicking in, and I was getting scared. I told him I wanted him to video call me. He said no. I fought him on it for hours one night, telling him that if he tells me the truth, I won't get mad. He refused. I put the name he gave me into Facebook, determining to find him on my own if he wasn't going to give in. Nothing came up on him. I texted him, telling him I couldn't find his Facebook, and he gave in giving me a completely different name, and told me, that's me. I remember just feeling cold as I read that. I looked at the account, and everything he told me was a lie. His name, his face, his age. He was 25, not 19. I was terrified. I thought I had been talking to someone just two years older, which is legal in my state, but he was eight years older. I immediately stopped texting him. That's when he started getting obsessive. He would text me dozens of times a day, calling me over and over again. He would beg me to answer him, to give him a chance. Then he started threatening me to answer. He told me that he had saved all of our pictures. He kept them all and told me he would send them to all of my friends and family on Facebook, showing everybody me in a bra and show our text messages, talking about what he would do to me sexually if we met. Looking back, all of that was more damaging to him than me but I was young and stupid and afraid. I hated my body so much and I was terrified of people seeing it. So I started talking to him again, more reserved and cautious this time. The days inched closer to my birthday and the weekend we had planned. Our messages had become bland and short since I was trying to make him lose interest in me. 
but he never gave up. If I took too long to message, then he would threaten me again. My birthday fell on a Monday that year, and he sent me all kinds of messages. I don't even remember what I did that birthday. I didn't have many friends, and I've never liked to celebrate, so it was probably small. When Friday hit, I got a text from him that morning saying that he was driving to my city and that he would pick me up from school. I was terrified. I had lost a lot of my friends the semester before, so they obviously had no clue of my situation. Out of desperation, I went to one of my guy friends, who I hadn't talked to in a couple of months, and spilled everything to him. He was a longtime friend, so he was sympathetic and promised to follow me home that day. I went straight to my car, ignoring the mass amounts of texts, saying, Where are you? I'm here. My friend drove behind me all the way to my apartment, which he had no clue I was living in, and stayed with me as I cried for a while. I turned my phone off and my friend left later that night. Brandon had no clue where I lived, but I was still paranoid. What if he somehow found me? Only three people knew where I lived, four now with my guy friend, and he didn't come in contact with any of them. When I finally turned my phone on, he was threatening me again. I was so exhausted and fed up, I started spam texting him, yelling and venting. I told him how stressed he had made me, and how what he was doing was wrong. I told him to send the pictures and that I didn't care anymore. I started to attack his character, telling him how no one could love him if he hides who he is, and then treats people like crap when they catch him in a lie. Thankfully for me, he had enough care for me to take my words to heart. He apologized and told me he deleted all the pictures. He swore to leave me alone as long as we can still talk every once in a while as friends. I agreed, even though I knew I was lying. I talked to him for a month, short responses until he finally gave up. Even now at 22, I still see his name appear sometimes. I blocked his number and deleted him on everything but his name still shows up sometimes on my Instagram or Snapchat when he is trying to re-add me. He's the reason I don't give my name or picture out. He isn't the first stalker I experienced. The first time was when I was in sixth grade, but that's a story for another time. I had recently moved into my own place at 19 due to my ex-stepdad being emotionally abusive towards me and my mom. I'm a female. I moved into a council state in the northeast of England. Before moving into the house, I was warned it was in a rough area. I was given the weekend to think over whether I wanted to move over here. Over that weekend, I visited the house at random times throughout the day to see what the activity in the area was like. I decided it didn't seem too bad, as I was moving there to have a place to live, not make friends. Anyway, I lived here for a year and never really had any bother by anybody, apart from one night. Let me just describe the layout of this house a little bit. It was a two-bedroom house with a back garden, with the gate to get to the back garden being to the right of the front door. I always kept this padlocked. My bedroom was above the front door with a window facing the front door and side gate. I also had a driveway which my car was parked on. I had just recently started working day shifts as opposed to nights, so my sleeping was pretty messed up at the time, and I would fall asleep pretty early. On this particular night, I was in bed around 9 p.m., started watching a show on Netflix, and fell asleep pretty quickly. Around 11, I was awoken to a loud banging. I stayed in bed and hoped it was just a one-time thing. But then the banging proceeded, and I could hear shouting. Can't remember what was being said, but I was pretty freaked out. Living by myself and no reason for anybody to be knocking on my door. Then while someone proceeded to bang on the front door, loud enough to sound like they could have broken it down, another of the party started to shake on the side gate. Luckily, it was padlocked. I then called my mom, who was on night shift at the time, so she answered pretty quickly. I was crying at this point and quickly filled her in on what was happening. She stayed on the phone to get me through the rest of this ordeal. I don't know how or why, but I got the courage to peek outside from behind the curtains. I could see two men, probably in their late 20s, early 30s. They were guys dressed in tracksuits and all around didn't look very friendly. 
At this point, I'm pretty sure they are heavily intoxicated with either booze or drugs, or both. After this carrying on for about 20 minutes, I realized they were not going to stop unless I said something. So me being brave and maybe a little bit stupid, I opened my bedroom window. I shouted down to them, Hey, what do you think you're doing? Now I can't remember the name that they said. Maybe Steve. The one had been banging on the door said, Get Steve out here now. Me being confused because obviously I lived by myself, said, Who is Steve? This guy then replied, I know he's in there. His car is here. Bearing in mind at the time I had a 19-year-old Toyota Corolla with a private license plate. For obvious reasons, I will not post what my private license plate is, but to put it simply, the plate is an abbreviation of my name. So obviously this Steve guy wasn't going to have a car with a girl's name on his plates. So obviously I replied to this guy and was like, no, that is my car, and then proceeded to ask my name. Stupidly, I gave him my first name, but not my last, thank God. He then asked, who else lives here? Again, stupidly, I replied, just me. Who thankfully after this remark, his friend who had been trying to get into my side gate was like, it's time to go. I watched as they walked down the street, away from my house until they were out of sight, to make sure they weren't going to come back. I then called the police and made a statement in case they ever did come back. Thankfully, that was the first and last time I saw them. Me being forgetful sometimes, I would forget to lock my doors. Thankfully, that night I had locked my front door because if I hadn't, I have no idea what would have happened. This happened a couple of weeks ago. I keep trying to push it out of my mind, but I can't stop thinking about it. I work a full-time job, but two days a week I pick up hours at a small neighborhood specialty pet shop owned by a friend of a friend. It's part of me doing her a favor so she can have some time off, and partly for her helping me have some extra pocket money to help afford my many hobbies. It's a very small store, the front comprised entirely of windows that grant you a full view of the entire space. Only one person can really work there at a time without it seeming crowded. It was my night to work, and up until that point, it had been relatively quiet. I moved some stock up from the basement, priced some items, and got a chance to say hello to some of the regulars. Nothing crazy. At around 5 p.m., two hours before the store closes, a crowd of friends come into the store looking for supplies for a new kitten that they just adopted. I shared in their excitement, made recommendations, looked at pictures of the new little bean, and eventually closed a total sale of around $200 worth of merch. Not bad. I bagged all of their stuff up, and all but one of them left. He said he would catch up with his friends later. He just had a couple questions for me. Up until that point, I assumed he had just been shy, or a boyfriend that got drug out of the house or something. I mean, he had just been hanging at the back of the crowd, not saying anything. Not laughing, or participating, or anything. I sort of brushed it off and asked what kind of pet he had, ready to dive into the sale. He said he had a pit bull, and was worried that he wasn't gaining weight quickly enough, and wanted advice for what he should be doing, and if that's normal. I asked all of the relevant questions, the age of the dog, sex, approximate weight, and if he knew the bloodline. Most dog owners that come to the shop are extremely proud of their dogs and can tell you literally anything about them. They'll brag about their dogs endlessly. This guy didn't seem to know anything about his dog, or even dogs in general though. He didn't know what I meant by a lot of my questions. I found it really odd, but I didn't worry myself about it and did my best. I have a pit bull at home that had an issue with weight when my partner and I first got her, and I know how alarming it can be. Since this is a subject that I know really well, more than most other people, I really wanted to help him out. The thing is, he seemed to insist on standing very close to me, no matter how many times I stepped away or distanced myself. He found a reason to get right back up against me. At one point, he stepped behind me to reach over my head and get something, even though there was plenty of space for him to grab it from where he was next to me. I was uncomfortable, but I pushed it away. I convinced myself that I was just being paranoid. I'm a small person, around 5'1", 110 pounds, and it's easy for me to feel a little uneasy. Even telling the story, I'm wondering if I'm overreacting. 
That's when I noticed that every time I tried to conclude the conversation with a solution, he would bring up something else and would refuse to settle for my answer on a product, thinking that maybe he was just being overly cautious about what the right solution would be. I shared with him a story of my pup and showed him some pictures of her. One inside my apartment, another at a community garden close by my apartment, just all over the place. He pointed at a couple of the pictures and zeroed in on the landmarks calling them out. He asked how many times I walk my dog a day. Since I had mentioned how proper exercise is important when building muscle in the pups, I didn't think anything of letting him know that I walk my dogs twice a day. I told him that I tried to space it out so that it's once in the morning and once in the evening and went into how that may be a good way for him to time his feedings. Every question, I kept trying to lead him back to talking about his dog, but he wasn't interested. He noticed the plural. He asked about the other dog. I told him the breed and the age. His questions became rapid fire. Do I take care of them by myself? What time do I walk them exactly? What are their names? That's when I realized I was essentially showing him our walking route. Quickly, I closed the pictures and put my phone in my pocket. I asked to see a picture of his dog, half changing the subject, half at this point trying to confirm that he had a dog that he was looking for help with. He hesitated at first, then pulled out his phone. He mumbled about a few things while he scrolled and searched. It took a few minutes, and this was the first time he stepped a few feet away from me since his friends left. He mentioned the landmarks again, saying that must be where I live, and mentioning that I wasn't that far. I stayed silent. Eventually, he pulls up the picture of a huge dog that looked nothing like what he had described, hanging out with people that weren't him. He claimed that was the only picture he had since he hadn't had the dog for long, and asked again if I lived by where the pictures were taken. At this point, I'm definitely alarmed, but I try to keep my cool. Freaked out and trying to hide it, I confirmed that yes, the most expensive products that I had were the ones that would do the job. I tried to assert that where I was living wasn't important and frantically began just ringing stuff up. That was the best thing I could think to do to end the encounter. I needed him to leave, and I needed to know he was gone. I rang up our biggest jug of liquid gold, our biggest bag of expensive dog food, a training book, all kinds of stuff. I told him the total, hoping he would either buy things and leave or tell me the usual, I'll be back on Friday, that I get after people see especially high totals. No cigar. He took a look at the total, nodded, and asked to know when I worked there, so he could work with me in the future. I told him it varied. He should take me up on my recommendations now, just in case and repeated his total. He ignored that and asked to use the restroom, pointing at the open door to the bathroom that we keep public. Not wanting to upset someone so much larger than me, with so little concern for boundaries, I told him he could. The second the door closed, I texted the friend that connected me with my boss. She lives in one of the apartments above the shop. Luckily, she was home and she came right down. When he came out, he seemed disappointed that we were no longer alone and resumed the behavior that he had originally displayed. I told him his total again, asking him how he would like to pay. His exact reply was, No thanks. I'm sure I'll see you around. The way he said it still sends a chill down my spine. I hope not, Creeper. I really hope I won't see you around. Since I am at home now, because of my fibro disability, I've got a lot of time to tell my tale. Back in 2007, I started a tech job with an IP slash phone slash VoIP slash DT1 slash long distance company. The company is no longer around, and honestly, I don't know how they stayed in business as long as they did. It was really a pyramid scam. But thankfully, I was on the IT side of things, so I didn't have to sell anything. It was a small, typical tech support call centre. The customers would call in or Verizon slash Quest etc. would call and say DT1 lines were down or outages. 
I was the only female on my team, having to prove myself and show that I could do just the same as my male counterparts could. It didn't take long and the customers respected me for being able to handle things. After making my mark, I decided to take the 10 hour night shifts. I worked Wednesday to Saturday from 1 p.m. to 12 a.m. and an hour lunch after 6 p.m. I was completely alone in the whole building. The rush to get out of the office by 6 p.m. was insane and I couldn't blame them. But I decided that having three days off was better than two. Like I said, I was by myself for most of the night. I would have to keep an eye on emails and make sure that I answered calls. It was a very slow shift. I would get a lot of time to play video games, read, do schoolwork, or just write. But sometimes, I would just wander the building, or call around just to get away from my desk for a while. I would have the VoIP phone system connected to my cell phone, so I wouldn't miss any calls. This allowed me to get soda, go get food, and so on. One time, whilst I was up away from my desk, I was going down to the lunchroom to grab a soda. The vending machine was on the basement floor, and the basement had a wall of windows and one set of security doors, same for the main entrance. Only, there was one camera facing that door, nothing else to make you feel very safe. I didn't like going to the basement much, because the back of the building faced an acre of dark woods. There was a walking path to the woods, but for some reason, they didn't install lights for the walking path. Never really sure why that was, but it really didn't help the creep factor. Sometimes I would see animals run past, but other times, I would feel like someone was watching me. I always tried my best to make it fast when getting a soda or snack, but sometimes, I didn't feel fast enough. So one night, I was making my way down to the basement of the building to get a soda. It was a slow dragging night, and I needed a little caffeine for a pickup. I counted my money as I walked to make sure I had enough to get in and out quickly. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw something dart from the glass door back into the darkness. I stopped dead in my tracks and tried to scan the forest, but like I said, it was just blackness. I felt a bit of unease, and everything told me to turn on my heels and go back to my desk. It was 9pm, and I had a fair bit of time left on my shift before I could blow this popsicle stand. I tried shaking the feeling off and briskly walked over to the soda machine to make my selection. The soda dropped down, and as I bent down to get it, I heard a loud ping noise. It was as if someone had hit the glass with something. I stood straight up, and felt the hair on the back of my neck stand. I slowly turned around, and was scared to see someone out there. But as I made the full turn, I saw once again, nothing but darkness. I thought this was a good time to book it back up to the main floor. I didn't bother with the elevator. I went up the stairs and ran up them. My heart was already racing for having to go down there in the first place, and then the loud bang, and now running up two flights of steps. Once I was back at my desk, I sunk down into my chair and tried to calm down. It was just one noise. I was in a building with locked doors and locked inner offices. I kept saying over and over in my head that it was nothing. I was relieved by that, but out of nowhere, I got the feeling that someone was watching me again. I peeked up over my cubicle wall and looked around my office. Nothing seemed out of place until I turned face to face with the front of the building. 
Outside the first set of doors was a slender, tall, dirty male. He was cupping his hands around his eyes to try and see past the reflections of the light inside. I dropped back down in my cubicle before he caught sight of me. He didn't look like anyone had ever seen at the office, and it was a little past 9pm. There is no good reason he would be checking out my office. As I sit in my chair, I hear the door shake. I slowly stood up and watched him pull at the handles of the doors. And to my relief, they didn't budge. But as I watched him, he turned to face me. His face looked bruised or dirty. I couldn't tell which. Once his eyes were locked with mine, he started to bang harder and smacked the glass. I was so scared. It was the middle of the night. I was by myself and out in the middle of nowhere in this office building complex. I grabbed my headset and dialed 911. While the operator was getting on the line, the guy was walking back and forth from one side of the glass to the next. 911, what's your emergency? The lady's voice was direct. I'm working over at 42 on Malavesta, and I need someone to come out now. There's a guy trying to break into my office building. While speaking with her, the guy disappeared from view. I tried to look in all directions, but I couldn't see him. I knew that he wouldn't just walk off, not with how hard he was banging. And out of nowhere, a good-sized rock came out of nowhere and smashed against the door. I screamed and went underneath my desk. The operator asked what happened, and I explained that a rock smashed against the glass door. She asked me if the glass was broken enough to let him in. I didn't want to stand up and look, but she told me to look in order to know where he was. I crawled out from under my desk and peeked over the wall and saw a huge crack down the first part of the door. I sank back down and told her to please have the police hurry. She said they were on their way. I have heard so many of these stories, and when they say that the cops couldn't get there fast enough, they aren't kidding. It feels like time is standing still, and you can do nothing. There was another smash against the door, but along with the sound of glass breaking, sirens could be heard coming towards my building. It was music to my ears. I told the operator that the police had arrived, and thanked her for all her support. I stood back up, and looked over the cubicle wall, and the red and blue lights were flashing wildly. But the thing I didn't see was the man. The top part of the door was completely smashed, and the rock was laying on the inside of the entryway. One officer came to the front door, and others were out combing the area. I could see their flashlights moving around the parking lot. The first officer to come into the building and greet me was very kind. He had patience with me and let me explain what I saw. Soon, my boss arrived and checked on me and the damage. At some point, my husband was called and I was told I would be escorted home by one of the officers. I took the next few days off and started to look for another job where I wouldn't be alone at night by myself. When I gave my statement, I explained to the officer that the person could be partnered with an ex-co-worker who was fired a few weeks prior for stealing and just not showing up. He knew when people came and went. He knew where they kept the cell phones that we were selling, not under lock and key, but under desk of the provisioner. From smartphones to Blackberries, when they were still worth buying, of course. I went to leave this job about a month later and started at a credit card machine company. It was an office full of people, still a call center, but I felt safer especially with security guard and cameras all over the building. Like I said before, the company is no longer around. It was bought up by another company, and they basically liquidated all the funds that were worth something. I am a 25-year-old female. 
I was 23 at the time this took place. I had been a college student, but had to quit due to a major surgery in my leg. So I was unemployed and had just spent a few months recovering. I was finally off crutches, but still limping around, and lived in an old Victorian two-story house that is now a duplex. I live on the ground floor, and a middle-aged reclusive woman occupies the whole second floor. There are separate outside entrances, you see. And I live with a male housemate that was also a friend that is a few years older than me and was employed as a security guard at a local casino. Our street is known for being seedy and not a good neighbourhood, but I've always felt pretty safe and never had too much trouble. One night, as I was home with my roommate and my boyfriend, we were all watching movies in the living room, which is out in the front of the house. My roommate's girlfriend then comes over drunk with another male friend of ours. The male friend sat down to watch movies with us and immediately passed out. And my roommate and his girlfriend went to his bedroom at the back of the house and immediately started having the most insanely loud intercourse I've ever heard. She always sounded like a trashy porn star. But anyway, a few minutes into the session, my boyfriend and I were still watching the movie, and we hear a loud scream coming from the back of the house. We couldn't distinguish what it was, maybe something getting knocked over, but we figured it was just my roommate and his girlfriend being extremely loud and all over the place. Eventually, they finished, and the house was finally quiet. Our movie ended and we decided to go to bed in my room. My room is in the middle of the house, and shares a wall with my roommate's wall, and the living room on the other side. My bed was against the outside wall of my room parallel to an old window that slides up and down. The side and back of our house are pretty high off the ground. Looking out the window, it's a decent drop to the ground. Outside my window are vertical and horizontal beams that extend to hold up a little porch balcony for the lady upstairs. It really ruins the view, having beams right there. My boyfriend went into my room and took off all of his clothes and jumped into bed. I started to take off my clothes too, but stopped, when I noticed the screens of my windows missing and it being open. I had a cat that at the time was indoor only, so my first thought was, the screen is missing, Striga must have gotten out of the window. Then I noticed that the window was pushed up way more than I thought possible. I kept thinking of my cat, though. I was obsessed with keeping her inside. My first thought was to look under the bed and to see if she was maybe under there. It was dark, but I saw a black mass and reached out to grab her, and thankfully she was still inside. The black mass wasn't her. It was a black hoodie. And someone was in it. I had grabbed someone's arm. For some reason, my first thought at that moment was that a friend was playing a prank on me, and it was probably someone I knew. So I kind of laughed it off and said, Hey, there's someone under here. Then I lowered my face to meet his face. And I realized I'd never seen this guy before in my life. This was not a friend and not a joke. I don't know this guy, I said in a less slightly calm voice, and my boyfriend was completely naked, and told me to grab my gun, as I was nearer to the closet than he was. Stay where you are, he screamed at the mass under the bed. The guy cooperated. I threw my boyfriend a robe, and he put it on, and jumped out of the bed, 
near the closet where I was. He took the gun and pointed it at the bed and told the guy to come out slowly with his hands out. Since my roommate is a security guard, I ran to wake him up for backup. He rushed into the room, and the three of us stood there with a teenage boy wearing a black hoodie coming out from under the bed. We were all kind of in shock, and we started to question the kid, who cooperated with us completely. He was being quiet and humble. His eyes shook violently from side to side, as if he was high or something. My roommate searched him. We emptied his pockets, and he had condoms, lube, porn advertisements from the back of the dirty magazine, and some dirty pills that he told us were Vicodin, but they were really just extra strength ibuprofen. He also had a pair of my dirty underwear in his pocket. Dirty underwear? That I had just had my period all over. That was the most disgusting part. We found ID on him as well, and a business card from a youth probation officer, so clearly he was a troublemaker. We also found a piece of paper, with names and phone numbers on it, that indicated he lived with his mother in a hotel room in a notorious drug motel that catered to prostitutes and men. His high school ID was from Hooper High, and he was clearly from the local Hooper Native American tribe, or at least part Hooper Native. When we saw he had no weapons, we started questioning why he was in my bedroom under the bed with all that stuff, and asked if he realised how serious this was. He quietly replied that he heard sex from the street and thought he could have some. Basically, he was a horny teenage boy on some sort of drug, riding his bike around at night, and my roommate's trashy girlfriend's sex noises were like a siren song in the night to this kid. He was so overcome by his horniness that he scaled the scaffolding and beams near my open window and crawled in under my bed, probably to masturbate, to what to he thought he was hearing in the next room. He probably jizzed on my underwear. He then kept apologising and saying he was sorry and God knows what. I was in shock and disgusted and wondered if he would have raped me if I'd have been alone. But we all felt a little compassion for the stupid kid. His fate was basically in our hands at that point, and we debated whether or not to call the police. We finally decided not to, and we basically lectured him and told him how lucky he was that he crawled into my window and not someone else's, because we could have shot him or called the police and had him arrested, and whatever he was on for probation for would have been a lot worse. He kept thanking us and was super humble at that point. My roommate then escorted him out the front door and took his bike that he had left on the lawn and walked him to his shitty motel and watched him go inside. We kept all of his stuff. He didn't have money, just trash IDs and phone numbers, and made sure to tell him we had his IDs and we knew where he lived. We had his mum's number and his probation officer's number, and that if we ever saw him on the street again, he'd regret it. A drunk friend and my other roommate's girlfriend slept through the entire ordeal, and we told them next morning what had happened whilst they slept. One particular instance stands out the most as the most unnerving thing that I've experienced. It's one thing to see a warning sign about a predator in the area, and it's another thing to be stalked all day. I went out one afternoon on my small jong boat to do some fishing in a swamp, mainly for warm mouth. I was pretty familiar with the area, I motored about three to four miles to reach my favourite spot. Alligators are fairly commonplace out there, and it's just something you become accustomed to. Generally, if you respect them, they'll respect you, as they've become pretty used to fishermen. 
The water in the swamps are full of tannic acid from the decaying leaves on the bottom. So the water looks inky black at first, and visibility is only a few inches. Anything that is visible just under the surface is tinted a dark amber colour. I had caught a few fish and noticed that around 50 to 60 yards back up the canal, a pair of eyes were floating just above the water and pointing in my direction. It was a gator, no big deal. They've learned to become more opportunistic and steal stringers of fish if you leave them hanging from the side of boats. I continued fishing for a few minutes and had just reached down over the side of the boat to grab the lip of a warmouth that I'd hooked. As I pulled the fish out, I saw the faintest glint of amber in the water, about a foot below where my hand had just been. I watched as the faint glint slowly rose upwards towards the surface of the water, revealing two black eyes and the largest jaw on a gator that I've ever seen in the wild. I slid back into the centre of my small jumboat as the head of the gator broke the surface. I could feel its back sliding along the bottom of my boat, shifting it slightly. After watching it for 10 to 15 seconds, it finally swam out from under the boat. I'm guessing it was pushing 12 to 13 feet. And that's after having seen hundreds of gators. This gator followed me for the rest of the day. I'd always motor a bit further away just to put distance between us. But not long after I'd stop, I'd feel that familiar bump on the bottom of the boat again. Each time, it would eventually just swim off a few feet and turn to stare at me. I've never felt more outmatched. This dark, quiet, toothy bastard had the ability to sneak up at you at any time it pleased and get within three feet of you before you even knew it was there. Do you know how unnerving it is to look at something in the eye that makes it abundantly clear that it's only waiting for you to make a mistake? There's a level of intelligence and focus in those eyes that makes you understand your place in the food chain. It's not the first time gators have followed me. I've been followed by three at once before, but none have ever made me so intimately aware that the only thing on its mind was to drag me out of my boat and under the surface of that black water. This was quite easily the closest I've ever been to cardiac arrest. And considered some of the professions I've had, that's saying a bit. In mid-2004, I became newly separated from my wife and decided a getaway and career change were in order. Call it a geographical cure, if you will, but that's a story for another time. I decided to move a couple of thousand miles from my home to attend a quick four-month continuing education course in industrial radiography and ultrasonics in Calgary, Alberta. I'd fared well in the course, and due to the oil boom happening in North America at the time, I was literally hired by a large company waiting outside the doors as we graduated from our educational endeavours. Taking the job entailed moving a further 800 miles into the north of Canada to be based out of a small town which serviced the surrounding oil fields. I had no idea what the place would be like and what I'd be in store for. At the time, the north of the Canada prairies had taken all of the influx of workers that it could and infrastructure really didn't grow with the boom. Trying to find a place to live up there was next to impossible. I am not at all stretching the truth when I say that people were renting their balconies for people to pitch a tent on a couple of places. I kid you not. Some of the places that ended up being rented weren't even fit for human habitation. This was the Black Gold Rush. I overstayed my company Chit in a hotel that they put me up for a month 
and was told that I had to find a place to live. It was absolutely next to impossible to find accommodations for a few reasons. I was working between 12 to 20 hour days and the vacancy rate was somewhere less than zero. I had decided to look at some outlying communities. I asked for a day off and ended up driving about an hour from our office and found a small farming community. I used the word community loosely. This was a spattering of easily 60 to 100 year old dilapidated houses centered around a greasy main street. Liquor store doubled as a post office, bar doubled as a hotel, and the grocery store looked and smelled of a slaughterhouse that could have been condemned. Wild West shit. I drove by an old house that had been obviously divided into several apartments. I almost couldn't believe my eyes when I saw the orange and black for rent sign screaming out at me. My heart did sink a bit. The place was clapboard, and the kind of dirty that you see before you even get out of your truck. At this point, after about a month of brutality on the pipelines of Alberta, I was exhausted and simply didn't care. It was irony abound. I was making wicked money and could afford to get an uptown place. But because of the boom, I was going to be forced to live in a ditch. Great. But I digress. I ended up taking an apartment in this building. That's an abuse of the word apartment. This was a dive beyond dives. They say that Alberta is rat free. But I can testify the statement is a crock of shit. And I don't mean just the variety of rodentia. The people living in this building could easily have qualified as something that had crawled from the oil and grease laden holes of a ship straight up to the steps and into a pile of meth on a cheap kitchen table. The place itself was enough that I could easily have said, let's not meet. Carpets that were once grey were now an indescribable clay colour. Dirt rubbed into dirt into the sail off tint paint, carelessly rubbed all over the place, with a one dollar brush, and the smell. The smell of unwashed hair wrapped around rotten vegetables that might have been thrown into a wet paper bag, and at that point you're getting somewhere close. After sighing loudly and handing two grand to the landlord in cash, I took the place. I didn't have a choice. Besides being exhausted, I knew I wouldn't get another day off, and I was right. I worked from July to December 24th without a day off, barring the day I procured my glorious abode. I had arranged beforehand to get a bed from Sears that morning, and I had it in the back of my trunk. I dragged the queen mattress across the barroom of the kitchen floor and into a place that had been divided off by 16th inch wood panels into a bedroom. For the next nine months, this would be my home. If the grubby kitchen table and one chair that were sitting in place wouldn't have been included, the only thing in place would have been that bed. That would be it. Except for my alarm clock on the floor. I get up at 4am, drive, work like a coal miner until sunset, drive, drink whiskey, drop on bed in overalls, and rinse a repeat for a hundred days. Literally. Then one Friday in October, I come home after a particularly brutal day of dragging my ass through the mud. My feet finally hit the kitchen floor at around 11 at night, and I was in a mood. I sat down at that pissant kitchen table in my fire retardant coveralls, covered in mud past my waist. You probably have never worked those kind of hours or those kind of conditions. But after a while, you stop caring just about anything. I sat there and downed about half a pint of whiskey in a quarter pint of time and smoked cigarette after cigarette, lit each one of the bastards with the last one I'd smoked. I knew I was in trouble with the drinking and smoking, but as with most things, I didn't care. I'd become married again, married to work, married to the mud, married to the oil, married to the welding, the pipe, 
and married to the hours that turned me as dirty as the place I inhabited. After I'd finished hating my body for another hour, I noticed it was past midnight, and I knew I'd had to be up in six hours. That was considered my day off up there, not starting work until 8am on the weekends. I crashed down on my bed, coveralls still wrapped around my waist, commando underneath. The rust scraper I carried to remove scale from welds before I x-rayed them, still in my side pocket. I reached over and clicked the alarm button with a sigh. I remember thinking that I was pretty sure that none of this was worth the money. I was a shell of a human being. In those days, I'd often drift in and out of consciousness whilst trying to sleep. I'd be buzzed, overtired, and really just resting until the next onslaught of a hundred welds. I remember that night hearing a fair amount of scratching in the kitchen, just past the partition that made my door into my room. At one point, I think I took exception to it and grumbled a bit. The mice, rats and roaches were louder than usual. Who knew what the crackheads were doing next door that night? Then I remember drifting off into a numbled, half-dreaming state. The scratching had stopped. I hadn't been laid in months and started in a semi-dream about a woman I'd seen at a gas station in one of the nameless towns we passed through as the crew. Then I saw her. Her shadowy form at the foot of my bed and I smiled. Then as the eyes slowly registered half open, I realised I was no longer dreaming, and that wasn't her, and that he was breathing loudly. He was standing at the foot of my bed, and I froze in terror for what seemed like 15 seconds. He grabbed my foot. Lisa! He breathed out at me in a slurred, throaty pitch that brought me in with the smell of chemicals that managed to overshadow both the whiskey on my breath and the hovel smell that was the atmosphere I lived in. Now, I'm not a huge guy, but when I get all kind of freaked out, I'm fairly strong. I remember not even thinking, just reacting. I pulled the scraper from my side pocket and launched myself, rolling sideways off the bed, wrenching my foot from his grip. I don't think I'd even hit the ground before I was on my feet and swung hard. I not only felt skull when that scraper connected with the front of his head, I heard it scrape across that shadow. The next blur would have been comedic relief had the situation not been what it was. He howled in pain, an almost in a hurt feelings kind of way. Because I was still half drunk, and had launched myself at him like a linebacker practicing on the full height tackle, my head went straight into the goddamn wall near the edge of my door, and sent me back straight onto the bed. I hit very hard whilst hyperly intelligently yelling, GAH! I remember the sound of my scraper hitting the kitchen floor with a shitty sounding clang. And I remember the bright flash as I fell backwards, and right before I'd lost consciousness, I remember thinking, oh shit, he's got me. I passed out. When I came to it, I don't really know how much time had passed. I came back slowly, but as soon as I remember what was going on, I made an attempt to leap back onto my feet, and dizzy as a dog that's been beaten. I fell sideways onto my left arm, and I felt it crunch underneath my weight. I remember screaming, shit, shit, as loudly as I could, before I got back up and charged into the kitchen. I slammed the heels of my hands into the wall, where the light switch was, flooding the greasy yellow light over the mess that was my kitchen. The front door was wide open. I was standing in blood, and no one was there. I remember hearing scurrying behind the door across the hallway from me. Like someone was trying to figure out what was going on in the cacophony that was my shithole apartment. I had a few lengths of pipe in the kitchen. They were two to four inch pieces of pipe cutouts, but welded together as test welds. I bought them home as examples of weld defects to study. I grabbed a two inch diameter sample of pipe that was about three feet long and ran at my front door. No one there. I don't really know how long I was in the bedroom for, but as the realization that the intruder had fled crept onto me, 
So did the adrenaline leave me. I began shaking, dropped the pipe, and sat down on the floor right in my doorway. The chick who was living across the hall opened the door and asked me if I was okay. I sat there bare-chested, with muddy coveralls up to my waist, curly hair turned into Jimi Hendrix on a bad night, with blood from my forehead running across my face, and I'm sure I absolutely stunk, and stunk of the whiskey that had screwed me into the doorway. It was probably a classic YouTube moment, as I, Jack Nicholson, looked up at her with my pointy eyebrows and sarcastically drawled out at her, Does it look like I'm okay? She slowly closed her door, and probably figured I was another oil-filled crackhead who'd gone off the rails for another holiday. What I saw then really bothered me. Almost more than the intrusion. The entire outer frame had been removed from the outside of my entrance door. The guy had worked hard to get in there. He wanted in. He wanted in quietly. And whoever Lisa was, I'm certain that he hadn't intended much good. Oddly, I remember feeling more nauseous about whoever he was going to rape or do God knows what to than about the actual intrusion. I stood up, closed the door, and picked up the overturned kitchen chair, plunking it down. Then I almost puked across the kitchen table, and whatever drunk there was left in me suddenly dissipated. For only one of a few times in my life, I was genuinely frightened, and I do not frighten easily. I remember waiting a while before I called the cops. At that time, the RCMP were often few in number and overworked in those remote areas. They never even showed up until hours later, explaining that, since I told them that he was no longer there, they felt it safe. Later, when I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror, face bloodied, left arm screaming in pain, someone else's blood on my hands, I remember wiping my hand across the mirror to try and get some of the gunge off the glass. I sat there and stared at the blood I left on the mirror for a good ten minutes and decided that my time in the town was over. I called my boss when the sun came up and told him he'd either be putting me back in a hotel or I was driving south and he could hire whoever deranged goddamn crackhead he wanted. He agreed after I explained the night and so came the end of my tenure at Hines Creek. So, you meth-head son of a bitch, let's not meet. Not in the dark, not in the middle of the night whilst I'm sleeping anyway. But by all means, come on by when I'm awake.